Now, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have your attention. Good morning, thank you. Um, very welcome to GMIT. Um, I'm Martin Taggart from the Department of Building and Civil Engineering. Uh, and I'll act as the conference chair today, um, assisted by uh, quite a few of the, the GMIT staff. Um, we'll just run through a, a few little bits of housekeeping matters just before we start, um, conscious there's quite a lot of visitors from outside the college. So um, fire procedures, we're not expecting any fire drill today, so uh, if the fire alarms sound to be treated as a, a real fire incident uh, to evacuate the building. So we're now in room 1000 with uh, two fire exits at the rear, two fire exits at the side. Our breakout room is immediately next door behind us, which is 994 uh, after tea break, uh, with two exits at the rear and uh, one exit at the front. Fire assembly point is uh, point F, which is just down at the front of the building opposite the JJ Rattigan's uh, Garda station development across the road. Um, conference car park in the, the building of the state's office, uh, I've said they'll go easy on all our visitors today. Uh, so uh, if you're doing uh, any of these things, thanks very much. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Um, we're going, uh, it's a, a permit uh, campus, uh, so there is clamping on site. Um, today, uh, it'll only be clamping uh, if it was the case that you're blocking fire exits or anything like that, uh, anything else. Uh, if you're fairly safe today, so uh, there's posters with the details around the place. Um, social media, um, is the Twitter account is there. We're doing a live blog and um, Twitter stream of the account, uh, particularly as well, um, if you're on Twitter there, there's the CIF uh, diversity agenda, uh, which we want to support as well today uh, for um, uh, getting uh, various minorities. We're, we're very conscious that we're a very male-dominated industry particularly, so uh, we support that. Uh, we have a com uh, competition that we're running and a uh, chance to win an iPad, uh, display board immediately outside in the lobby, uh, so do have a go at that. Uh, CPD certs, there's a sign-in sheet, uh, all of the professional bodies and CIF are also uh, backing us for uh, CC, uh, CPD points for today. So uh, if you want a CPD uh, certificate, uh, easiest way to do it is you sign the register that's going around, uh, Noel Crane and Irene Hayden, then Will, there's Noel over here. Uh, he'll prepare those and they'll be ready for you to collect just after lunch. Okay, so I'll now ask the president of GMIT, Dr. Fergal Barry, just to do the official uh, welcome uh, to the college for you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Good morning and welcome. First and foremost, I would like to welcome all our speakers without whom today's conference uh, would not be possible. We have 12 speakers presenting today, some of whom have traveled from the UK to be here with us. Uh, some have traveled from across Ireland, while some are very local. All are, however, leaders in their respective fields. And I welcome their generosity in giving their time to attend and inform us today. And of course, we will reflect on the, the golden triangle of time, cost, and quality. We'll hear about Grenfell and the, the timing issue around housing and the margins on housing. I'm delighted to note also today that three speakers here today, Patrick King, Oliver Mahan, and Ursula Jedral, who's with the Stuarts, I believe, are GMIT graduates. We're very proud of your successes to date, and I wish you well in your future endeavors. The construction industry is still in recovery mode. For example, the last significant strategic development on this site here at GMIT was over 18 years ago by Ratigans, and the cranes you've seen across the road uh, were indeed used to build this building that we're in here this morning. We're all very well aware that Ireland may well lose its competitive edge and advantage if our successive governments do not think more strategically about the long-term infrastructure needs of our country. GMIT, for example, has a capital investment deficit of 90 million euros, and in the face of that, has witnessed a 44% growth in student applications over the last three years, 16%, 22%, and 6%. 
Unlike the university sector, uh, we do not have an approved borrowing framework for the Institute of Technology sector. Indeed, since 2008, the seven universities have borrowed 700 million euros from the European Investment Bank at about 2%, as 50% matched funding for the development of their campuses almost a 2 billion euro campus development plan across the seven universities. If only the Institutes of Technology had a similar borrowing framework. This is but one example of the need for investment in our social infrastructure, from housing supply to health provision to inadequate transport infrastructure to energy and education. Indeed, on the housing scene alone, there are 4,500 social houses required here in Galway. The emerging national and international interest in the provision of student accommodation by the likes of GSA will also help take the pressure off social housing demand. Many voices, including the European Commission, the OECD, the IMF, the Construction Industry Federation and so on, call for dedicated action in Ireland on addressing this macroeconomic imbalance. Constraints limiting the construction sector and the supply of housing can generate risks of further imbalances if they are not resolved. Thankfully, this pressure has yielded some release in those constraints. Our job today and in the future is to make sure that the announced measures will be effective and free of any adverse unintended effects. We need to monitor the situation closely. A 2016 report uh, from consultants McKinsey estimated 51 trillion in infrastructural investment will be needed worldwide between now and 2030 keep up with the expected growth in economic output or GDP. That requires countries to invest an amount equivalent to between 3% and 4% of GDP each year. Until recently, Ireland has planned to just spend 2% of GDP, which without doubt would have held and will hold this country back. Poorly planned and poorly performing infrastructure actually costs economies a good deal of money in the long run and it also limits economic investment as well as well as social development. We're all too well aware that Ireland's capital infrastructure will struggle to meet the demand in the coming years. We have seen what a relatively short snowfall can do here in Ireland. We've been investing too little, the time frame for delivery has been too long and we've not been thinking strategically enough about the long term needs of our country. Thankfully, the mid-term capital review has been completed and we've seen the launch of the National Development Plan to much fanfare, as it's been of course, and a promise of 116 billion euros of investment. I, for one, welcome this announcement of 116 billion euros of investment that will see the investment rise to 3% of GDP by the end of 2018 and 4% by the end of 2024. So the search is on for shovel-ready projects. I hope that in parallel we'll also be able to help address the well-known failure to streamline planning and delivery of key projects which, if not delivered, will be detrimental to our economic outlook. And of course, the irony is, the Supreme Court is currently hearing three cases involving planning matters from Clare, Curry, and Galway over the next three days. Two of them appeals to the Supreme Court by on board Planola in a newly opened courthouse in Limerick developed under Part 8 of the Planning and Development Regulations 2001. There's irony for you. We, you and I, now need to hold everyone to account for placing national development plans and frameworks on a statutory non-political footing. For a variety of different reasons, it makes sense to invest in infrastructure and it makes sense to have a long-term coordinated plan because that gives confidence and confidence builds economies. Today I'd like to thank our principal sponsors, the Chartered Institute of Building, represented by Chair Michael Gallagher, the Chartered Association of Building Engineers, CAVE, Southern Ireland Region, represented by Chair David Courtney, the Western Region of the Society of Chartered Surveyors of Ireland, represented by Chair Pat Carter, the Construction Industry Federation, Western and Middle, Mid, Midland Region, represented by CF Director Justin Malloy. I'm also pleased to note that the President of CAVE, David Taylor, has travelled from the UK to be with us. Today, David, you're very welcome. He is joined in our first conference session by the President of CAF, Dominic Doherty, who I also met earlier. And you'll hear from both David and Dominic shortly, where they, they will review some of the challenges and opportunities facing the construction industry at this time. I want to welcome, in a special way, colleagues and students from around the country. 
the University of Limerick and Cork Institute of Technology, my alma maters, the University of Ulster, IT Sligo, NUIG, and the Castle Bar campus of GMIT. We have many delegates attending from a variety of, of uh, professions today with all disciplines uh, in attendance. Representatives from local authorities, government departments, semi-state organizations, the health service executive, the professions, and contractors. You're all very welcome, one and all, and I trust you will have both an informative and enjoyable day. Uh, please take the opportunity to network, and for our students, it's a unique opportunity to build and advance your network with such a wide range of professions and disciplines in attendance. On departmental matters, in building and civil engineering, we've had another very busy and successful year. It's essential for GMIT that our students are equipped for the workplace and thereafter in a position to develop and enhance their careers and professional standing. Accreditation of our programs is an essential ingredient of that pathway. I'm pleased to confirm that our civil engineering honours degree has gained full accreditation from CIOB for the period 2017 to 2022. There's an ongoing welcome and general trend of improvement in CEO demand for our built environment programs. Retention is still a live issue in building and civil engineering. To address these issues, we've initiated a wide range of measures to engage and assist students in their transition to and through third level. A math support centre, an academic writing centre, one-to-one -one interviews, peer-assisted learning, etc. A significant number of students cite financial issues as their primary reason to withdraw from their programmes. It would be remiss of me having discussed the need for capital investment not to focus for a while on the recurrent investment that's also required. So a word or two on the wider issues of funding of third level and its implications. We've seen a doubling in the number of students opting to pay their student contributions by instalments here in GMIT. We are awaiting the deliberations of the Joint Directors Committee on Education and Skills on addressing the current underfunding of higher education and the future funding of higher education. So I wish to share yet again uh, the position outlined by the Technological Higher Education Association, the presidents of the 14 Institutes of Technology, in our submission to the Joint Directors Committee. That paper proposes the introduction of free fee for students studying up to level seven in higher education as one element among several, and it has been fully costed at about 200 million euros. The Technological Higher Education Association, CIA, is generally not in favour of income contingent student loans, as our students, not only within the IoT sector, but within the university sector, are mainly from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds, and any extra debt would present yet another obstacle to participation. The evidence also shows that income contingent student loan models generally only well work well in large scale economies. I'm pleased to note significant demand for both our graduates and placement students. At present, the demand is outstripping supply due to bottlenecks created in the economic downturn. This will, of course, correct itself as numbers in first year and second year move into third and fourth years of our programs. This year, we've introduced a six-month placement into our civil engineering and quantity surveying and building economics programs. So I want to congratulate and thank staff for that initiative. This has helped alleviate part of the shortage in regard to placement of our students. Of significant note is the high demand in regard to our BIM, Building Information Modeling, HDIP, intended to upskill professionals from industry. Several, several applicants have availed of recognition of prior learning, uh, which is a wonderful en entrance route uh, without a prior qualification. So our staff are available uh, to talk to you to today about that particular program. On the jobs front and industrial placement, for our students that commenced their studies in 2014, and those of you that are here today and that you've pers persevered, enviable job opportunities await you. It is no exaggeration to confirm that our program staff are being contacted on a weekly basis by employers with excellent job opportunities uh, for our graduates from all over the world. In the GMIT annual graduate survey, I note again that building and civil engineering graduates are amongst the best paid graduates in terms of initial starting salary. On the construction industry more generally, we'll hear today from Tomas Kelly uh, that we're expecting about 14% growth according to ACOM's uh, latest annual report. And this indeed will lead to expanded job opportunities uh, in the industry. This growth represents a very welcome change from our experiences when the initial International Construction Management Day conference was first discussed in 2010. 
On the GMIT campus development front, uh, I'm delighted to announce that GMIT has secured almost 40 million euros of capital investment on this campus alone in the past two years. Our IHUB building, phase two, has gone for planning, and I hope we will have no further delays, although we're being asked for further information, uh, so that doesn't bode well. A new STEM building uh, as part of a PPP bundle uh, of 11 projects funded across the Institutes of Technology sector, 200 million euros of building projects that hopefully will go to site in 2020-2021, and we've also secured funding for site acquisition here at GMIT. So finally, I want to acknowledge the leadership of Jared McMichael, our Head of School of Engineering, Mary Rogers, the Head of Department, Des Foley, uh, our Head of School of Science, David Lee, our Buildings and Estates Manager, and Jim Fennell, our Financial Controller, in securing all of the necessary investments, which are a prerequisite for our planned technological university in partnership with IT Sligo and Letterkenny Institute of Technology. As a consortium, we remain open to other partners uh, to build a new university of scale west of the Shannon and along the east, uh, western seaboard as one engine of economic and regional development, supporting the emergence of the counterpole to the greater Dublin area. Imagine a university with 150 million euros of a balance sheet in those three institutes, or a university with a balance sheet of 250 million euros and the availability of funds of four or five or six million euros every, every year to service borrowing for a new strategic development zone. Perhaps in time, such an entity can also consider projects at the scale of Trinity, one billion euros in the Docklands, or the University of Limerick's planned strategic development zone of one billion euros in building a new town uh, on the uh, Clare side of their campus. Legislation enabling the development of technological universities before the Shannon is before the Shannon on Thursday of this week, I hope, at the final committee stage. A very special thanks goes to Martin Taggart uh, and his team of colleagues here for their leadership shown around this event over the last eight years. Thank you very much, Martin. Enjoy your day, everyone. Thank you. Uh, could I just ask if the lads uh, sitting down at the sides just want to come in? There's plenty of seats in the middle, so you just be let in. No, I think we're the attention. I think we're settled again. Um, so uh, must give my uh, apologies. Uh, we've ever a change of speaker to um, what was sent out in some of the earlier programmes. Uh, unfortunately, John O'Regan, who's our stalwart speaker at the conference for the last seven years, has uh, been unavoidably called to the UK. Uh, at a point when he couldn't get out of. Uh, but being a good surveyor, he is. John uh, gave us the problem, but he also gave us the solution. Uh, so he proposed uh, his colleague, uh, Thomas Kelly. Uh, Thomas is uh, one of the principal authors of the ACOM annual review, so uh, uh, well on message and uh, very capable of replacement to uh, fill John's very big shoes. Um, so uh, Thomas is a Chartered Quantity Surveyor, he's uh, also a Director of uh, ACOM within the Cost Service Area. Uh, Thomas leads the Galway Office Team, coordinates services uh, on cost to cost some of the regional offices in Ireland. Uh, his experience ranges from delivery of public sector, uh, health, education, uh, commercial and industrial uh, projects. 
Uh, ACOM currently, just give the scale of the operation, have over 600 people across the island of Ireland and provide a, a very full range of multidisciplinary project services. So uh, we'll ask uh, Tomas to address you on uh, a review of the construction industry where we stand. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks very much, Martin, for the kind introduction and uh, to Dr. Barry for the welcome. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a great honour to present to you this morning, and I suppose uh, really what um, the brief Martin kind of set out for us is that uh, to present in relation to a review of the construction sector in Ireland uh, in, on, on foot of our annual review release just over a month ago, the ACOM uh, Ireland annual review. And uh, I suppose it's a review that we have been publishing over 30 years, and I suppose we've seen a lot of changes in that time. Um, but uh, yeah, and one of the, the key things to note really is the cycle in, in the construction industry. But um, I'm pleased to say we're very much on, a, on, a, on an ups, upswing. And I think it's particularly important at this point in time, I suppose, just to acknowledge and uh, um, GMIT as a key stakeholder in the, in, in the, in the region and in the sector uh, played a pivotal role in supporting the construction industry. So as I suppose as a quantity chair, I'm delighted to say that we, you know, to echo Dr. Barry's comments in respect of the placement program this year, which is a, a significant uh, development, a very positive development. So I suppose the title of our review this year was Sustaining Growth, and in an era as where we've seen uh, significant increases in our population, businesses expand both domestically and uh, foreign direct investment. The role of the construction industry is critical in obviously sustaining itself and growth in the industry, but more particularly in sustaining growth in the wider economy. It, it, it plays a, a pivotal role in that process. So what I wanted to touch on today were some of the headline projections coming out of our industry review. Uh, and then we also conducted, for the last number of years, an industry survey amongst colleagues, uh, professionals, and consultants, and contracting organizations in the industry. So just to kind of give you a flavor of the responses that we got back in relation to that. And uh, then moving on to the second half, looking really, I suppose, at some of the wider issues around resilient cities and infrastructure, and uh, of course, uh, a, a few slides on the national planning framework, which was published uh, recently by the government and which came out after our annual review. But just uh, I've included a few slides just to uh, uh, kind of paint the picture of where we see it. So I suppose looking first then at the Irish construction industry and some of the you know, key headline projections and facts and figures in, in the review, in terms of construction output, we estimate that the value of construction output at 17 billion in 2017, that was an 18% increase on the previous year, so very strong performance. And we're looking at 14% growth in value in 2018, up to 19.5 billion. So just shy of the 20 billion mark. So I suppose the, the headline figures are, are very positive, but of course it doesn't don't tell the full story. And uh, it's like everything else, I suppose the 18% and the 14% are strong, but they're not necessarily even across the country. And I think it's something that we're particularly, uh, you know, conscious of, uh, based here in Galway, as I am myself, and uh, and I'm sure all of yourselves are very familiar with the, the, the issues of regional development and uh, an even spread of it, and, and maybe something we will touch on a little bit more in, in, in my later slides. In terms of the, I suppose, the sectoral split of the output, uh, the residential sector will be the predominant sector at just over 8.5 billion, followed then by the general building at 4 billion and civils at 4.5 billion. So uh, I suppose not a, not a non-familiar picture in terms of the, the, the split by sector. And uh, 
just to just to acknowledge uh, that a lot of the figures here are, are based on CSO data interpolated based on our, our assessment really of where the market is. So I suppose in terms of employment, which is obviously of keen interest to a lot of uh, GMIT students and potential uh, graduates in the year to come, uh, again, a very positive environment in the last year. We saw a 7.5% increase, or 10,500 increase in the numbers in the construction sector uh, up to the middle of 2017. So we're looking at around 147,000, and I'm sure in the last six months the numbers have increased further again. So uh, quite, a, quite a positive story albeit a long way shy of the, I think somewhere in the region of 230, 240,000 that were employed in the sector at its peak back in 2007, 2008. So very strong performance, and uh, certainly there's uh, plenty of opportunities for students in all aspects of the construction sector, um, both from on the apprenticeship, uh, uh, trade, and professional uh, levels. There's a wide range of opportunities. I suppose it does point to the potential skill shortages, and we have seen the increase in the CAA numbers coming into the sector, and I think we all, we all have a duty, uh, whatever area of whatever profession we are, to continue to encourage uh, students through the secondary level to, to consider the construction sector as an option. Another measure which we looked at in the review, uh, it's a useful barometer really as well of activity and potential activity, is looking at the percentage of planning permissions by sector uh, and by, by, by floor area, square meterage. So I suppose looking at up to in the year up to the, the, the first half of 2017, the dwellings, the residential sector accounted for 57% of floor area granted planning permission and then on to commercial at 12 percent. Apologies if uh, you, you can't read the, the detail there, but commercial at 12 percent, industrial at 7 percent, and agricultural at 15 percent, other government health and education 7 percent, and social use buildings 2 percent. So a reasonable spread, but again, the residential sector quite, quite dominant. I suppose in total, uh, in the year up to the middle of 2017, we saw a 15% increase in the area uh, of buildings granted planning permission since the same period in 2016. And that 15% increase is primarily driven by a 33% increase in, in dwellings in the residential sector and a 59% increase in industrial buildings, albeit from a very low base on, in, in terms of industrial. You can see there it represents about 7% of the overall total. So in the, in the context then of the regional spread of those planning permissions granted and the floor area granted, um, we'll just in this chart here just indicate really that the spread, the BMW border Midlands and Western region accounted for about 24% of the area granted planning, Midwest 8%. South 26% and Dublin and the Mideast region 42%. So I suppose it, uh, if we look at the BMW region, it probably represents about 47% of the geographic area, but the planning permissions granted are, are almost an exact correlation to the population distribution. So whilst it's 47% of the floor uh, the, of the geographic area, it's about 24% of the population as well. And the, planning permissions granted almost exactly mirror that. So I suppose it's an interesting uh, uh, it's a in interesting correlation. And I suppose in, in that context, in, in building the counterbalance to the, the Dublin and the Eastern region, uh, it's, it gives you an insight into uh, some way to travel, really. I suppose we talked a little bit earlier about the, the value increases in 18% in 2017 and 14% in 20, uh, 2018 to come, and, and they are significant, but I think a distinguish, we have to distinguish between value and volume as well. Uh, so 
tender prices play a key part in that uh, comparison. So last year we saw tender price inflation on average around 7% in, across the country. This year, 2018, we're projecting 7.5% in the kind of greater Dublin area and 5% in the, the, the regional parts of the country, uh, giving an average of about 6.5%. So if we're looking at 14% value growth and 6.5% or 7% of that is tender inflation, that means then that the, the balance 7% is volume growth. So it does, uh, it does color our uh, interpretation really of the figures in the, in the sense of they're not necessarily as strong as they sound, but at the same time, I think any sector in the country would settle for 7% volume growth, uh, a very strong performance. Um, I suppose just to dig a little bit deeper into the figures and looking at the public capital program and the exchequer spend, um, the uh, I think last year they, they grew by about 12 percent. So uh, again, so, sorry, this year we're looking at 12 percent volume growth, which is a very strong performance. And I suppose the question is, do we have the uh, shovel ready projects to deliver that and also the skills and resources to deliver? Um, I suppose I won't dwell on the Northern Ireland sector, but it is a, as an all-Ireland business, ACOM, Pay uh, you know significant uh, effort, of, but, but 300 of the 600 staff that Martin mentioned uh, uh, at, the, at the outset uh, work in the Northern Ireland sector, so it is it's performing very strongly as well. And we're looking at, I suppose, some of the figures there: six and a half percent growth in employment and uh, output up by 11 percent to about 2.8 billion. So uh, a not insignificant uh, target market for, for, for all sectors of the economy. I suppose just to move on really and to look at the survey then that we conducted as part of the industry review, this year we were kind of focusing on innovation, sustainability, regulation and technology as well as some of the other questions that we, we that they all favourites in terms of challenges and projections in terms of growth. So I suppose a couple of questions that we asked, the prime, what are people um, in the industry consider the primary drivers of innovation over the next five to ten years? And uh, interestingly, I suppose we saw cost reduction coming at top with program reduction and quality coming uh, thereafter. So uh, the, that triangle that was referred to of time, cost and quality, certainly playing a, a key part in it, but uh, interesting to see cost coming out on top. I have down at the bottom here, you'll see the, the subset of the survey for the BMW region. Um, so you'll be glad to see that quality came out on top in the, in the BMW region as, as the driver of innovation and then cost and safety, which again, I think we're all acutely uh, aware of the need uh, for improvements and innovation. In terms of sustainability, not surprisingly, energy, water and transportation uh, feature strongly in terms of where we see the most advances in design and construction in the next decade. And in terms of technology, and I know that we're going to have a number of speakers in uh, talking about BIM and other areas of technology throughout the, the day, and I suppose in that context, where people saw the most transformative technology in the next five to ten years, BIM was out on top, followed by modular and virtual reality, and uh, very similar results in the, in the Western region with uh, just VR and modular switching places. So then we asked a series of questions really in terms of where we saw the fitness for purpose of the current regulations and standards in, the, in a number of areas. And there's a little bit of detail on this, so I won't dwell on it too long, but it's safe to say that the green bar in the middle is what we should be looking for in terms of satisfactory. So in terms of fire, 50% thought it was satisfactory, universal access, so uh, safety, very strong, 65%. But the, I suppose the other one out really is the planning sector, which again is probably no surprise in the sense of uh, somewhere in the region of 17% thought the planning system was satisfactory. So I think it's plain to see where the industry see the, the, the scope for the most improvements. 
<coughs> then if we look at how we assess the maturity of the Irish construction industry in terms of, I suppose, compared to other developed countries, in terms of the kind of four key areas that we were talking about in the review, technology, innovation, sustainability and regulation, if you if you take it that the the uh, the bottom two uh, sections are leading lights and strong performers, unfortunately we're we're not really registering as a leading light, a small small piece there in regulation, and we're seeing as a strong performer by about somewhere between 15 and 25, 30 percent broadly across the board, but not exactly a, a stellar performance. So again, I think we we have some room to go, uh, average being the, the kind of general score achieved. And in terms of, I suppose, what we saw as the biggest challenges facing the industry in 2018, resources, tender inflation, and the whole area of planning and statutory consents were seen as the, the top three, I suppose, challenges facing into 2018. And finally, I suppose, in the survey, we asked, you know, what we saw or anticipated in terms of our level of business in 2018. So again, a strong performance of 61% seeing an increase, only 4% seeing a decrease, and the balance 35, no change. Uh, in terms of the BMW region, that was a 50-50 split between increase and no change. So a slightly, slightly more conservative projections in, in the region than uh, across the, the country as a whole. So just to move on then, I suppose, to a further area that we looked at in the um, annual review, ACOM as a multidisciplinary practice, as um, Martin uh, uh, outlined at the start, I suppose we're in the, in the whole engineering, environmental, transportation, water, all of those sectors, uh, the importance of I suppose resilient cities and infrastructure is I suppose, a part and parcel of what we do and uh, at the core of everything that we uh, we do. And so in this year's review, we had a number of thought leadership pieces in respect of the likes of sustainable development, water sensitive regeneration and urban regeneration playing a key part really in uh, in, in the economic, economic growth generally. And I suppose a couple of examples there in our review, but also globally, ACOM have undertaken uh, a series of infrastructure uh, thought leadership pieces. Uh, and I suppose a couple of things just to kind of focus our attention on the importance of cities and infrastructure in the way we approach the future. And half of humanity uh, live in cities at the present. But by 2050, it's estimated that 70% of the global population will be living in cities. Uh, I, I suppose that kind of puts it in a kind of stark picture. But what does it mean? Well, it means that providing a growing urban population with energy, water, nutrition, and security, as well as a long lasting and reliable infrastructure and shelter, is the defining challenge of our time. And I think it's, whilst it is a global issue, it is also very much. A local issue and it's something that we, we are all very familiar with and what are the impacts of a, a weak infrastructure well it's a, it very much hits our competitiveness but it, uh, uh, in the US for example they estimate that failing infrastructure will drive up the cost of doing business by 430 billion uh, in transportation costs in the next decade just uh, uh, mind-boggling figures but as I said, it's not just a, a global issue. Uh, we don't have to look to the US. We can just look to our, you know, in, in our own local uh, city here in Galway, we, we see every day the challenges faced by the transportation and public transport. Uh, it really is a, it is a problem, but it's a problem that we can, we can and, and have to challenge, challenge and tackle. I suppose we looked at transportation in terms of flooding. The consumption of the natural buffers in our environment uh, it, it, you know, is a, it really exasperates the problem. So protecting our rural and green spaces is critical to playing that part in flood prevention. 
And again, we, we've all seen the impact of it, and coastal cities have even more critical resilience issues. So here you see Blackpool, but we could be looking at Galway last year, and the impact of the flash floods that were, uh, uh, and there's the prom, for example. So again, we, we, it's a global issue, but it's also a local issue. So, as I mentioned, that ACOM have published a series of uh, infrastructure uh, thought leadership pieces on, uh, on, on, the, on the global stage, I suppose, and looking at it from the global perspective. So, uh, if, you, uh, if you want to find out a bit more about, I suppose, what the challenges are, we, we surveyed, I think, somewhere in the region of 500 of the kind of industry leaders on the global front in terms of where they saw infrastructure going and what are the challenges. Uh, so that, 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 that's, I'm, I'm sure the slides will be made available afterwards, Martin, and so you, you can find the link there from those slides. Just the, some of the facts and figures around what are the drivers in terms of skills, innovation, resilience, funding, all critical infrastructure uh, issues. And I suppose it's that last one there, funding. Uh, and the different models of funding uh, I might just turn to next in looking at, I suppose, the National Planning Framework, which was recently published. It was published after our annual review, so the review doesn't have it per se in it, but uh, I, I've included a few slides here today just for, uh, I suppose, to kind of, because it's very pertinent really to where we're going in terms of the construction sector. Um, I suppose, Project Ireland 2040 was published recently, but uh, and, and, and has an investment plan of 115 billion over up to 2027. So a, a huge investment level, but it's not it's not something that should come as a surprise that there's a requirement for it. Uh, ACOM, through our annual review for the last number of years, have been public, publicising, I suppose, and uh, the emphasis on the need for infrastructure. So if we just take a snapshot of some of the review extracts in 2014, Frank Conlon, who did an interview, kindly did an interview for us, <coughs> was head of property in IDA, uh, identified that it's important that there needs to be continuous investment in terms of infrastructure. And if we look at 2015 then, we, I suppose, mapped out really where the actual and projected construction industry output was versus where the optimum should be. So. This blue line here was actual construction output, the crash, and then the, the gradual increase to, I suppose, where we are in today's terms, versus then the optimum construction output is seen as 12% of GMP for a, an economy like ourselves. So you can see the significant gap there, that, that infrastructure gap, essentially, and that, that was in 2015. In 2016, our executive summary identified the significant deficits in social infrastructure, both uh, in terms of housing, health, education. Um, so again, beating the drum, I suppose, effectively in terms of calling for uh, increase. And then last year, then we revisited that infrastructure gap that we talked about in 2015, and again, just highlighted the gap uh, in the infrastructure investment in that period. So I think cumulatively it was something like 90 billion over that period. So an investment program now of 115 billion is very welcome, but it's also very, uh, very, uh, very necessary and, very, and required. So as I said, the national planning framework and the national development plan, which were published as part of the uh, the project Ireland 2014 contained, uh, I suppose, this, uh, a whole series of um, recommendations in, uh, across all sectors of the industry. So certainly um, I, I dipped into it just to pull out some facts and figures, but um, I found myself kind of going off on different tangents because there was a lot of, a lot of very interesting and very uh, uh, detailed information in it. And I know some of the other speakers will touch on it as well. But just in terms of some of the facts and figures, I suppose, the targeted pattern of growth has been, I suppose, widely publicised. But the, the, the country has, as if I just flick back there, the, this kind of three principal regions the northern, western, southern, and the eastern and midland. And in that context, then, in terms of the targeted pattern of growth, we're looking at somewhere in the region of 
500,000 in the eastern and midland region up to 2.85 and so on you'll see 350 odd thousand in the southern and somewhere in the region of 170,000 growth in, in, in the northern and western region up to a million euro in population. And there's a little bit more detail there, I won't dwell on those, but I suppose as a QS I couldn't but look at the, the numbers in terms of euros a little bit more detailed. So the sectoral breakdown you'll see there in terms of the 115, 116 billion how it breaks down transport infrastructure, which after I suppose the last few slides that we had in terms of the cities and infrastructure, uh, very pleasing to see the 23 billion it targeted for that sector, energy and environment, 20, social housing regen, 14 and a half, education, 14, and health, 10, and Irish water, uh, eight and a half. And um, I suppose we only have to listen to the news in, in the last few days, uh, in the, the water issues and the housing issues and the transport infrastructure issues, typically, certainly the, the, the right areas have been targeted, whether it's enough, or whether it can be delivered, uh, they're, they're big questions, I suppose, and time will tell. In terms of the expenditure timeline and how that's plotted out, you'll see there the exchequer, which is uh, direct government uh, spending, is in the green and topped up then by the non-exchequer or uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, on top of that, you'll see 8 billion in 2018 up to 14 billion in 2027, and then a gradual rise in between. So that's the distribution effectively of the 115 billion. So I suppose it is a very, it's a very strong and steady performance. And I, I just took a snapshot of it. Uh, sometimes I don't like people to look back at the old, old income annual reviews just to check, you know, some of the projections might have been exactly spot on. Uh, but I do like to look back at other people's figures. So uh, I look back at the 2015 NDP capital plan allocation. Uh, so in 2015, in the period 2018 to 2021, there was a projected spend of 19.23 billion in that four year period. Then if I look back at the budget 2018, which is published in October, uh, there's a plan for 26.8 billion, uh, billion, yes, uh, 26,840 million or 26.8 billion. And if we look at the national planning framework, which was just published, that has increased to 29.6 billion. So in effect, we've had 10.4 billion increase in the projected capital spend in 2018 to 21, depending on the timeline. And that very much reflects, I suppose, the state of the economy and the funds that were available <coughs> based on the strength of the economy. So it's a very strong story in terms of, you know, where we are as an economy that we are, you know, growing. And, and I, I think in terms of percentage of national um, uh, you know, just the three percent permitted expenditure. I, I think it's probably going to somewhere like four point one percent. So it's not, it's not, it's, you know, we're certainly not losing the head in terms of uh, expenditure profile. But it's, it's a very welcome development because in, back in 2015, when we were focusing in some of those charts and graphs on the infrastructure gap, you know, the, and at that time, 19 billion was being anticipated to be spent. So certainly, up at 29 billion now tells a, a, a much uh, cheerier story. Uh, I suppose the Project Ireland 2040 also sets out objectives, and uh, objective 2067 is that the, the, the five cities of Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Galway, and Waterford have to set out metropolitan area strategic plans to align with the national planning framework. And I think that uh, obviously has to be a priority for Galway and, and the, all the other cities. But of course, work has been ongoing in different aspects of the uh, infrastructure development. And the Galway Transportation Strategy 2016-2036 is one example of that. And uh, certainly, there's big changes of push, and somewhere in the region of a, a billion euro plan to be spent on the outer bypass and other 20 other interventions uh, as part of that plan. Uh, so 
I suppose we're all very familiar with the plans and uh, we, we just need to get on with it now. So I, we understand that the planning process is to be uh, submitted in some time in 2018 and I'm sure Gus and other speakers may be able to enlighten us a little bit further. But I suppose aside from the infrastructure, in terms of development, then again there's a lot of uh, development on the cards in, the, in, in Galway City. So whether it's in the harbour or in the CIE lands at Cairns Station, um, Air Square, Bonham Dock, there's a lot of developments at different stages of the development process and there's a lot, a lot of opportunities. So combined with the transportation strategy and the private development, and the greater development in the environment of Galway City, um, there's a lot of reasons to be positive, uh, and it's bound to be transformative in terms of uh, Galway City and its environment. So I suppose on that note, I'm going to conclude. I hope I haven't gone too far over time. Um, there's a link there to the uh, annual review if you wanted to download it. As I say, you'll get the slides. I also have a number of copies out in the lobby, so feel free to uh, dip into that and happy to take any questions at, at, at the questions and answer stage. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're ready to go again. Um, so I just thank uh, Tomas Kelly particularly for, for stepping in at the last minute to, to help us out. It's much appreciated, Tomas. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dominic Doheny. Uh, Do Dominic is president of the Construction Industry Federation. He's a graduate of both Bolton Street and Trinity College Dublin and has been joint managing director of John Flanagan Developments since 1989. He's also former chairman of the Irish House Building Association, brings a wealth of personal experience spanning more than three decades to the role of president uh, and he will hold uh, the role of president for two years. Uh, we've heard from uh, Thomas Kelly uh, where we've been as an industry uh, and where we are now. Uh, Dominic will give us his thoughts on where we might go in the medium to longer term for a sustainable <coughs> and prosperous uh, future industry. Thank you, Dominic. Good morning, everybody. Firstly, uh, I'd like to um, congratulate Martin and his team for uh, running this ex exceptional event here this morning and for their commitment to the future of the construction industry and to Tomás for his uh, presentation also. Today, I want to look forward to a construction industry in 2020, 2030 and 2040. When you look at the graph of the economic history of the industry, you see a roller coaster with peaks and troughs every 10 years or so. In 2007 to 2013, the distance to peak and trough was approximately four to five times greater than any time previously. I want to talk to you today about the industry, about the industry breaks and to the volatility in this cycle. The collect collectively, we all realize that an industry with smoother economic cycles and sustainable growth is better for business, society, and economic development for the country. In other words, I want to talk, to you, talk to you about how we end the boom and bust in construction. By, by doing so, we can avoid a recession like the last. But more than that, we can build a world-class construction industry here in Ireland. To start, there's no doubt that there is a lot of positivity about and around the industry. This is to be welcome after a lost decade. As I am from Tullamore, I will have to temper this positivity slightly. I know many of the construction companies present here today are still only in recovery mode. Outside the greater Dublin area, there is an absence of work to sustain construction business in the regions. But for the moment, the national narrative about the construction industry is positive. Output, employment and exports are up across all sectors. Government strategies such as Rebuilding Ireland the National Development Plan, the, the National Planning Framework are significant political and financial commitments that can underpin growth in construction up to 2040. We should view these documents as a transformative opportunity for Irish construction to, de to develop a reputation as a global leader. The way I see it over the coming decades, 
there are three scenarios for how the industry can evolve over the next 25 years. In scenario one, we as a nation repeat the mistakes of the past. In this scenario, we underdeliver on the ambition of the MPF. We experience another bust when the economic cycle turns down again. In scenario two, we, re we repeat some of the successes of the past, build the 35,000 houses per year required and a large portion of the 116 billion in the National Development Plan. In this scenario, the industry continues to use existing technology, business models and relationships in the supply chain to do so with minimal innovation. Whilst we are still standing still, companies from outside Ireland see the opportunities, enter the Irish market and eat our lunch. I would consider the first two scenarios as nearly equally disappointing failures. The third scenario, the only one we should consider and that I'll refer to as, as the smart sustainable growth scenario. In the, third, in the third smart sustainable growth scenario, the government and industry collaborates to rapidly modernize construction. The government invests in the construction industry as an e economic force multiplier. Industry, seeing the opportunity, invests in technologies such as lean and BIM. As a result, in delivering the MPF and the NDP, Ireland produces a cohort of lean, productive and tech-driven companies that can compete globally. Let me expand on the smart, sustainable growth model Ireland needs to, to pursue. Smart means technology-enabled growth, where more companies adopt and adopt technologies such as BIM. It also means Ireland produces more constructive IP. Sustainable means constru construction activity helps us meet climate change. In addition, the model is based on the development of sustainable relationships in the supply chain. And finally, in this model, growth should see output raised to about 12% GDP, significant employment increases, including amongst the female population, and a radical increase in construction exports of products and services sold in more global markets. So this is the ideal growth scenario for the industry and the wider economy over the next decade. Let me now, now talk about some challenges to the realization of this model. Demand for skilled workers will outstrip supply for the coming decade, and we need to act now to prevent acute shortage in future. A DKM survey showed that we would need 9,600 managers, 8,700 associated professions in the industry by 2020. This is a positive news for the students attending GMIT's world-class built environmental environment courses. It'll be a buyer's market when you are all seeking employment for the next couple of years. As an aside, I'm deeply concerned about the low level of women choosing the industry as a career. Only 5.5% of the workforce is female. We cannot build modern, a modern industry on this basis. The CIF has embarked on a year-long campaign to increase the number of women working in construction. The Building Equality campaign aims to show young women that there are careers in construction for them and the industry is changing. I would ask GMIT to join CIF in this endeavour. I personally want to work in an industry where my daughters feel welcome and can build a career. So we need the education, education system to increase its output rapidly. The government must match its ambition in the NDP and the MPF for an equally ambitious and visionary investment in the education and training system in relation to built environment courses and apprenticeships. At third level, it should secure the best construction tech, upskill academic staff where possible, and reshape curricula to reflect the changing requirements of industry, students, and the state. It should also be used to prime the pump of third level research into construction, something that Ireland inexcu inexcusably do not prioritize in our national science and innovation strategies. I often marvel at the, st at the state resources devoted to the food industry. Last year, state funding to the state agencies established to support and grow the agri-food uh, industry, Borbia, Chagas, BIM, Marine Institute, 
Sea Fisheries Protection Agency, saw their funding grow from 230 million in 2016 to 241 million in 2017. My point is, where is the commitment to research and development for the construction industry? The truth is that industry and academia have not collaborated effectively. We as an industry only turn to the government for work. That's our failing. Other industries ask for work, then they ask for supports and research grants to do the work. So the first action that we as an industry and GMIT and other third level inst institutions should take to is to get our ducks in a row and make a coherent case to government for increased investment in R&D in construction. The government should be willing to invest in increasing the industry's capacity and the research into construction and technology. It makes sense on several fronts. We are so embedded in the social fabric of Ireland and central to the economy that a healthy construction in industry is prerequisite for a prosperous Ireland. Consider the following. There are over 35,000 construction related construction companies located in almost every Irish community. 99% of these are SMEs with, with less than 10 employees. There are over 46,000 self-employed people in the industry. We employ 130,000 people directly. Directly and indirectly, we support nearly 200,000 jobs in the economy, or 10% of total employment. Each month, we are hiring almost 1,000 people. In February, we marked 50,000 additional people hired from the low point in 2013. But our impact is wider than simply providing employment. Every sector of the economy depends on us. Martin Shanahan, CEO of the IDEA, stated in 2015, Ireland's construction sector has the potential to create regional distribu distributive jobs and wealth. It is also a crucial factor of competitiveness in the economy as it provides the infrastructure and building on which every other sector relies. This dual role means that a sustainable and competitive construction sector is a vital component of Ireland's economic recovery and growth in the future. We should be proud that we are a major part of the reason Ireland has over 1,000 foreign companies employing over 120,000 employees located here. Building for these international cl clients has dri driven innovation in our specialist contractor sub subsector. They have also led the five-fold increase in exports since 2009. To meet the demands of international clients like Intel, Facebook, PayPal, these companies have embraced new technologies and practices such as BIM and Lean and in turn interna internationalized them themselves. They and pioneers in other industry subsectors exemplify the path of in industry must take if it is to realize the vision of smart, sustainable growth I outlined earlier. It won't be easy, but the rewards are huge. The global construction market will grow to $10.5 trillion by 2020. PwC estimates it will grow by 80% to reach $15.5 trillion by 2030. Capturing small percentage points of this growth could build a significant cohort of companies of scale. An export strategy to address this opportunity must begin at home and must begin now. We, had, we have heard Thomas's um, presentation earlier predicting a 14% year-on-year growth in 2018. Our own analysis estimates that the industry will continue to grow at 9% on average and reach 20 billion output by 2020. That's a good start. The introduction of the National Planning Framework backed but with a 10-year National Development Plan last month is another positive step. After many submissions from the CIF and others, the government has acknowledged that Ireland's infrastructure investment has been unsustainably low over the past decade. We are currently spending only 1.8% of GDP on infrastructure, and only about 60% of this was on construction-related productive infrastructure, such as roads and rail. To make matters worse, somewhere close to 50% of the remaining spend was on maintenance and repair of existing infrastructure as these assets were deteriorating. 
The ambition of both documents is to be lauded. I would like to commend the government for attempting to take on the issue of the unplanned and unsustainable sprawling dominance of Dublin on the detriment of the rest of the country by creating the NPF. However, construction companies will face significant challenges in translating these concepts into concrete. The public sector procurement system must be streamlined to ensure maximum return on investment for the exchequer. Adopting best practice from the Dutch or German models could break the lowest price approach that often leads to project delays, project overruns, and adver adversarial unproductive relationships between players in the, in the supply chain and public sector clients. Nearly 20 years ago, the then Taoiseach Berti Ahern launched, launched the National Spatial Strategy. This was the predecessor to the MPF. He said that, all other government policies must and will be consistent with the National Spatial Strategy, whether it's transport, health, education, or housing. That vision of joined up thinking never happened. The National Spatial Strategy was only partially implemented. At least this government appears to have he he headed or heeded our calls for more effective monitoring of the delivery of infrastructure investment. The Oireachtas and industry must be able to monitor progress on infrastructure progress or, uh, that are shelled, stalled, or over, over budget, so red flags can be raised. The final note for optimism was the establishment of the construction sector group within the National Development Plan. I see it as a key step towards the vision of an industry characterized by smart, sustainable growth. I would be very interested to see how the MPF is implemented on the ground. Regional assemblies are front and centre in ensuring the MPF principles are incorporated into our local authority development plans. The new planning regime the MPF employs might take at least two years to bed down if there is no delay at national pol uh, politics level. In the meantime, the projects of the National Development Plan, such as the M20, the Metro and others will begin to roll out with 30% of the 116 billion already allocated. We must ensure that legislation is passed at national level as promptly as possible and that our local authorities are resourced up, that they are, they are resourced up to deal with this influx of investment so the NDP and the MPF do not become decoupled. For this to work, I think the central government must resource and support local authorities to replace some of the skills and competencies lost over the past decade. This is critical because to access some of the two billion in regeneration funds in the sort of, competi the sort of competitive process envisage envisaged in the MPF, local authorities and companies will have to make credible joint proposals. Those that can't could see their areas stagnate. The full ramifications of this hasn't dawned fully on either industry or local authorities yet, in my opinion. So in fairness, the government have put in place three complementary strategies that I believe lay the foundation for su sustainable construction industry and, eco and, and an economy over the next 25 years. By that time in 2040, I believe that unless we have built a national economy with dynamic regional economies, we will have failed. Because construction companies are dispersed around Irish commu communities and are a vital part of rural economies, they are eminently placed to strengthen regions by providing jobs, but also by building the homes, infrastructure, and specialist buildings required by Irish society. So the lack of construction activity outside the GDA and the Cork region particularly should worry the government, as it has the potential to undermine the ambition of the MPF and the NDP. This is not scaremongering. We recently met with the IDA, and the lack of housing, particularly apartment building, was their biggest concern in relation to attracting and retaining AI. Several country managers of global corporations, such as Apple, PayPal, and Google, have all cited housing and accommodation for their employees as a major issue. Yet, most regional builders do not find it economically viable to deliver projects outside the Dublin area. The govern government have put in place a huge amount of initiatives through rebuilding Ireland and successive budgets to stimulate housing and accommodation supply. The Help to Buy scheme, the Local Infrastructure Housing Activation Fund, the, the House Building Finance Ireland initiative have all reduced costs 
provide the finance and stimulate the supply. Unfortunately, these uh, initiatives are subject to political approval and as a result can take about two years to get through the doll. These measures can then take another six months to bed down within the local authority system. With the usual delivery time for housing construction, the impact of these measures will only truly be felt in the coming years. Despite some issues around house building figures, uh, around some um, house building figures, the trend would indicate that these measures are having some impact. It is anticipated that the total number of new completed housing units could be around 22,500 by the end of 2018. If this is achieved, it will be a 77% increase in supply on the 2015 completion level. If we get house building up to a level of 35,000 houses per annum output, the rewards are huge. For every 10,000 homes we build, we not only provide homes for people um, and renew communities, help address the homelessness, reduce the rental crisis, but we will also sustain 25,000 construction jobs. By the time one of you is up here addressing the next generation of students, I want the industry's reputation as a haven of world-class talent to be well established. I want th those students graduating to be as highly respected in Irish society as any other profession. I want them to work in an industry that is seen as a key enabler of Irish society and economic and cultural life. I want the everyday person to walk down the street and have their lives enriched, unknown to them by the quality of the construction this industry delivers. Reputation is key. The industry welcomed the Building Control Amendment Regulations, or BCAR, when they were published in 2014. But the industry has taken further steps to ensure quality in construction. In 2014, the CIF established CIRI, the Construction Industry Register of Ireland, a register of competent builders and contractors in Ireland. This body comprises of industry representatives, associated professions and the government and registers companies that pass strict entry criteria and pro proven competence, expertise, financial robustness, etc. For, for the consumer, the CIRI logo is a sign of quality and competence in construction. In time, our aim is to have the consumer demand and pay a premium to companies for Siri built homes. We also intend that Siri registration will become a stipulation in awarding public sector <coughs> contracts. To strengthen the system, we have worked with the Department of Housing to have Siri on a statutory footing in legislation. We expect that, that legislation to pass during the lifetime of this government. When it passes, it will, I believe, that is a critical step in the long journey towards a global tech-driven innovation construction industry. Currently, over 800 companies have fully registered, with a further 1,100 companies in the process of registering at various stages. When it is put on the statutory footing, an estimated 15,000 construction enterprises will have to register with Siri if they want to operate in the industry. The CIF will face a massive backlash from those companies who can't meet the standards but it's the right thing to do. Like any industry, we need to protect c consumers from certain elements. So in summary, the industry is in good shape. We need an additional 112,000 skilled employees to, to deliver required construction activity. In truth, we probably need a tenfold increase in the number of construction-related courses at third level and the equivalent in training programs to meet the skilled demands. Martin and the team here, I expect, will be very busy for the next decade or so. Thank you again for the opportunity to talk here today and I wish you well for the rest of the event today. Thank you, Dominic, for the very insightful uh, observations. Um, Uh, so I'd like to welcome our next speaker, David Taylor, uh, back to Galway.
Uh, David is uh, President of the Chartered Association of Building Engineers and um, joining us today from the UK. Um, he's been in private practice uh, for over 25 years. Uh, oh, sorry, he's been in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in practice, private practice since 1993 and is the Managing Director of David Taylor Associates uh, UK Limited. Uh, based in Kings Lynn in Norfolk. I think we're heavily uh, impacted by the snow last week. Uh, places. Uh, they provide architectural design and contract management services across a broad range of public and private sectors, carrying out numerous projects uh, throughout the UK and Europe. Along the way, have been recipients of a, a number of prestigious awards. Um, as we heard from uh, Dominic and to some extent uh, Tomas, uh, digital technologies are really starting to disrupt the traditional patterns we've seen in the construction process. So David's going to take a look at the challenges and opportunities we face in the change world uh, digitalization. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Lovely to be back again. I had the opportunity of being here two years ago and, and speaking then, although it was cut short due to other speakers running over time. Um, but it's, not, it's nice to be back. Um, listening to the speakers already this morning, there's a couple of things that... It's the same key words coming out. Um, challenges, investment, technology. Um, and as Martin has rightly said, I private practice 25 years, I've got an architectural background. Um, I'll just, if I can just bring that up. So just to give you a little bit of an insight about me, who I am, because I realize a lot of you don't know me, um, but I do, I am the managing director of my own practice, 25 years architecturally, but digital technology is now moving at a, a, at a different pace. I tend to give a talk as a president of the Chartered Association of Building Engineers about quality, quality in our industry. And it's kind of got a little bit bigger since the Grenfell inquiry has kicked off. So in coming to you today, we've stayed away from the quality debate and try and focus on the technology debate, which is taking over. So that's not a business card, although I can put my number up there for you if, many, if you want it, but... Uh, it's not a business card, but that just gives you a bit of an insight about me, who I am, what my directives are. So let's take you through this and just see where we can go with technology and look at what we've got at the moment and where we're going to be in uh, the next several years or, or more. Um, so many of us know who this man is. Hands up in the audience, anybody who doesn't? <laughs> Thank God for that. Okay, it's a famous man and a famous quote. Um, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. But he also went on to comment that construction is one of the first businesses that humankind developed. And it continues to shape our daily life in unique ways. Virtually all of the businesses rely on the construction industry to provide and maintain their accommodation and infrastructure. And construction is a determinant of where and now almost everyone lives, works, and plays. For nearly the entire population of the world, the quality of the built environment and technology heavily influences the quality of life. So when we read into these words, and as time moves on, how does the design, engineering, and construction sector evolve to ensure a continuation of quality? And how is modern technology fitting in? So to understand the future, we must understand some of the past. The world is changing faster than ever before. Long gone are the days of working how we once did. But while most other industries have undergone tremendous changes over the last few decades, some of which we've already heard from our speakers earlier, and have reaped the benefits of their processes and innovations, the construction industry has been hesitant about fully embracing the latest technological opportunities. Our industry has vast potential for improving productivity and efficiency thanks to two new, new technologies and new construction techniques. But to capture all this potential, it requires a committed and concerted effort by our global industry across many aspects from technology, operations and strategy. 
through to personal advancement, qualification and regulation. But is our industry still holding back or are we embracing change? So some words up there from John Beck, Chief of ACON. Notice the, the words this morning that we had. Looking at construction projects today, I do not see much difference in the design and execution of the work in comparison to that of 70, 70 years ago. He's, he's also quoted that getting where we have got to date and beyond has been a slow and arduous journey, but megatrends are now shaping the future of design and construction. And given the sheer size of our global industry, even a small improvement in technological application would provide substantial benefits for society. It's now up to industry to embrace these new opportunities more vigorously and change the way it has traditionally operated. There is so much potential in the construction industry, it is now ready to be unlocked. Other industries such as the car and plane industries have undergone radical and disruptive change and their digital transformation is now well underway. So those working in the, within the construction sectors now need to act quickly and decisively. So there's a couple of quotes here that I've put on, on the screen when we take John Beck's comments, how do we take things forward? So we've got Steve Jobs of Apple and Albert Einstein. So as, as industry develops, new technologies arise designed to streamline processes and increase productivity. In the architecture, engineering and construction sectors, those technologies can cater to anything from internal company processes to the design stage to on-site construction. But these advances are usually carried out by a team or a group of people. But are we now at risk of surpassing this interaction? People are naturally averse to change until they can appreciate its practical application saves time and effort. But the issues arise when new technologies clash with traditional methods and industry veterans are reticent to embrace the potential dividends these technologies have to offer and continued education and growth is paramount to any success. So how do we overcome these barriers? How do we educate or move away from the old saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it? So how is change being developed? Technology develops through experience, communication, collaboration and engagement. But it's our personal judgment call as to whether we embrace the change or choose to stay as we are. Are many of us passive professionals or are we embracing the industry avenues of change? It's a personal risk and avenue. If we put too much water into a watering can, it will overflow and industry professionals can be drowned with the knowledge, pressure and attitude of change. But our fill and pour slowly, industry will embrace the knowledge and move with an easier flow. It's like the lottery. It took time to develop, but we all now buy into it. Industry collaboration has to be far better rather than it being seen as a challenge to the most basic advantage of pooling talent, expertise and resources. <coughs> Innovation and technology is driving industry change and through close collaboration, communication, engagement and knowledge sharing, sharing, our industry has a diversity of skills to lead beyond the scope of many other professionals. Designing for today with an awareness of the past for a future none of us can foresee has never been more difficult. But collaborating and exchanging with fellow members has never been more easier. And through this collaboration, grasping new technological processes offers us creativity to enable us new ways of working. Collectively, we have the industry building blocks that can make this transformation happen, turn barriers into drivers, and most importantly, unlock innovation across the global construction industry. And by sharing and encouraging innovation practices, this has to be a vi vital progression to increase productivity and production techniques. If we don't engage and collaborate now, and make the relevant jumps in embracing innovation, we, or many of us in this room, are simply going to be left behind. So the construction industry has been looking over the parapet for far too long. New opportunities are emerging, and new developments are reshaping our industry, from new technologies to revolutionary construction techniques. New technologies and innovations improve collaboration, especially in supporting the work of today's enormous global challenges. 
and by slowly and intelligently integrating new technological features into our daily practices, the transition between traditional and new technology can be seamless, causing minimum disruption to projects, performance and quality. So what are the innovations which improve communication, collaboration, value and better engagement? Where are we now? How do we solve this puzzle? Or how are we solving this puzzle? The journey so far, communication, it was limited, other than the old wind-up phone. We also had the handwritten letter approach, which could take days to reach its destination. The old drawing board, which many of us in this room can still remember using. In fact, some of us may still use the old drawing board. Hand drawing, then using the old process of a dye line machine, smelling of ammonia, and moving on. We then moved on to compu computers and the production of 2D drafting. This took forever more for industry to embrace, but over the past 25 years plus, 2D CAD drafting has become the normal design-based office tool. So as the technology has advanced, faster computers enable design pack packages and designs to expand, and computer tablets and smartphones now enable us to use CAD drafting even when we're traveling, providing us an opportunity to produce drawings of 3D and 4D quality and on to building information modeling along with the digital revolution, which is now shaping the future of our industry. The pace of innovation with improved communication and engagement in our industry has been encouraging, but more is to follow. Robotics, computerized design, and a host of other technical and work process innovations are helping to create a global industry that is now more productive and cost effective and increasingly environmental friendly and sustainable. So as we begin to shape our industry future, what are the innovations which are spearheading our transformation? So let's start with communication. When we look at communication and engagement, this has been a key barrier we have overcome. And the effective integration of technology has created a collaborative tool which has enabled us all to communicate and engage with ease. And by the flick of a button, it's a barrier we've overcome and advanced with creativity and imagination. Trekking simply showed us the way. We simply harnessed the concept and developed the science and advanced the technology. So communication is now dominated by an iPhone, Android, social media generation. And wearable technology now enables us to access emails and communicate by the flick of the wrist anytime any place, anywhere. Skype enables us to visually meet up with each other thousands of miles apart, and cloud-based collaboration systems now enable us the opportunities to connect our global expertise in one virtual office. But what about other barriers and innovations we are now transforming? BIM, something we all now very familiar with, and it's been mentioned a couple of times this morning. So BIM is the current buzzword and the biggest success story to date and critical to the procurement path of many projects, both in the UK and globally. An industry now through BIM 360 is constructing buildings in our computers. BIM technology is revolutionary for construction, bringing together design, planning and infrastructure and enhancing communication between contractors, subcontractors and the supply chain. It's a construction industry initiative which meets with the smart cities agenda and the Internet of Things concept. You all know about those two things. The smart cities agenda and the Internet of Things concept. If you don't know those things, I would advise you to look them up on, on Google as fast as you can. With the data and analytics being combined to create a big data set for the built environment, it's said BIM will improve performance and quality, and it certainly will from a collaborative point of view. Will we all use it? Will we all need it? Smaller practices will stay with 2D systems for the time being, but the global framework of large-scale practices are using it, and clearly cost, safety, workmanship, and performance standards are said to have improved where used. It's a progression in a platform that eventually we will all need to grasp. So as I have mentioned earlier, we're moving from simple 2D drawings to 3D and 4D visualization and through the virtual experience. BIM is now providing the opportunity for clients to see the animated finished article way before a spade or a digger even enters the ground. 
Here we have an example of a complex services system design and the coordination of installations and how it can be greatly improved by embracing the BIM opportunities and concepts. The bottom right image simply shows an example of how BIM visualization design in the healthcare sector in particular is now working, aiding and benefiting from the virtual experience. Five-dimensional BIM. It's a new word out there in a collaborative environment. 5D BIM is now the new keyword. It provides a new component to the efficiency with the help of cloud technology. Using a cloud-based environment that makes the project accessible, or accessible, should I say, to everybody involved in the process, and everyone can work off tablets, tablets, mobiles, PCs, smartphones, and iPads all at the same time. 5D allows people to be involved in the conversation from the on offset. Instead of working in isolation, waiting to provide the information about their piece of the project when it's their time. This technology also allows automatic generation of quantities to be processed quicker, provides more accurate data and allows the user to explore new ways of providing efficient designs, performance and costs. Governments are now moving to secure this process for all public infrastructure projects. Britain, Finland, USA, Singapore are now all using this protocol. Personally, I think it's a worry also for the QSs, quantity surveyors. But as time goes on, we'll see how that one works. Modular construction, mentioned earlier this morning. It's advancing and it's taking BIM technology forward. Off-site construction is now developing. With the new opportunities emerging, the new developments are reshaping our industry. From innov innovative technologies to revolutionary construction techniques. And if we remember John Beck's comments from the earlier slides, embracing these technologies must be acted upon quickly and decisively. One of the potential areas in the construction industry and which is now being embraced is off-site construction, which has the potential to encourage a greater diversity of people, including more young people into the sector due to the weatherproof working conditions and reduction in the use of manual labor, whilst contributing to environmental and sustainability targets and responding to commercial demand. The increasing uptake in off-site construction can realize endless opportunities for all industries, and there are four main categories to off-site construction systems. Non-volumetric pre-assembly, volumetric pre-assembly, complete buildings, and component sub-assembly. The UK, Poland, and China are now leading the way in modular, modular construction but other, constructors are now, other countries sorry, are now reaching out to embrace this concept. We're all familiar with the Dutch and German Huffhaus system, but a new breed of Lego-style off-site construction is developing fast. Facet Homes in the UK are looking to develop 1,900 homes in Graven Hill, Bicester, and a further 11,000 homes are planned, which will effectively become Britain's biggest new town formed to totally from new modular design and construction. So what are other innovations that spearhead in our transformation? Digitizing construction. A few, a few years back, people were rendering 3D models and walkthroughs with virtual reality. But industry has now progressed to live walkthroughs, which are far more intuitive to clients. Clients can now walk through the designs before buildings have even commenced under construction and with the freedom of the whole building layout, whereas before you had a certain area or a pre-recorded area that clients could explore. But now you can go anywhere, and new design options can now be easily explored. This is enabling project teams to design in the con context of real-world systems, and virtual reality and augmented reality is open to bridge the divide between the technical documentation and the finished product. Virtual reality. One of the best opportunities for virtual reality is as a health and safety training tool or other industry-related training tool. It can be used and is now actually being used for site inductions and as part of ongoing training program to make people aware of hazards and teach them how to respond to risks in a controlled and measured way. A virtual induction means that employees can walk around the site to familiarize themselves with fire exits or facilities, which again helps to mitigate risk and it can be used like the hazard exception test in a driving examination. 
Aircraft pilots have learned how to fly under simulated condition for decades, so it makes sense for other industries with highly trained operators to follow suit, to reduce risk. If you immerse someone into a real life situation within their work environment, you can train them effectively and safely in what is essentially a life scenario rather than learning reactively on the job. We can input the risks, make them aware of them and teach them to deal with the situation. Augmented reality. Augmented reality is being applied in different scenarios and it can be easily applied on site and will eventually be used through smartphones and tablets. Currently models can be overlaid against the actual reality of a building with pull-up data and this can then be merged with what you're seeing on your smartphone or tablet. Technology is developing and changing so rapidly, its applications in construction are becoming more ingrained and virtual reality and augmented reality are expected to have a major impact on the building sector over the coming years. Drones. The demand for drone technology in the construction industry has, become an increasing, has been increasing over the last few years, and drone technology is becoming a common element in any surveyor or site manager's day-to-day -to -day toolkit. Designers gain a clear understanding of site restrictions and challenges, allowing for more creativity walkarounds and better preparation for handling problems at an earlier stage of the project. Reality capture jumpstarts project delivery by starting with a 3D site representation as soon as a site scan begins. And this, meets site, and this means sites can now complete a topographical survey in less than an hour and have the processed data in their hands ready for analysis within 24 hours. 3D printing. 3D printing is revolutionising the way in which next generation architects and designers think and approach the problems. Top left is a simple design example and a printed model as used by architects, simply re replacing the old traditional model making methods in a fraction of the time. And the top image right is a real life 3D printed pedestrian bridge as being used in Europe. Bottom left is the first 3D printed 37 square meters two-story dwelling carried out in Beijing in June 2016. And it took a month to complete. And bottom right is the first 3D printed house which was carried out in March 2017 in Russia. The house being again 37 square meters was built in a day at a cost of $11,000. And by a company called Apis Core who are the world's leading 3D printing specialists based in Russia and San Francisco. They built house, this house using a modular printer on site. As the technology surrounding it improves, 3D printers are becoming increasingly versatile. They'll be used for an ever-growing number of tasks in a manner similar to the last two decades of our digital expansion via personal computers and 3D printers, having virtually limitless potential as the technology driving them improves. <coughs> Nanotechnology. This technology has been developing the ability to build simple structures on a minute scale. As nanotechnology is becoming an accepted concept, nanometer scale technology is building machines on the scale of minute molecules, such as motors, robot arms, and even c small computers, far, far smaller than a single cell. This technology also provides a UV resistance in coatings and paints to make surfaces scratch resistant. These services also prevent the formation of bad smells, fungus and mould, and basic construction materials, cement, concrete and steel, are also benefiting from nanotechnology in the added strength attributes it provides. Graphene is also part of the nanotechnology concept, and despite it being flexibly thin, it's strong enough to protect from a bullet at close distance. And it's quoted that mobile phones will soon be benefiting from the gra graphene properties. The graphene concept is also now being applied to building materials on a larger scale. And it's likely that in the next five years, graphene will be recognized for its uses in a variety of many building product applications. I'm not sure if you're aware of nanotechnology, just how much it's been about. It's been about for many years and it was first used by the cosmonauts in the space programs, and NASA use it today in the space shuttle programs. So what are the other innovations which are on the increase? Rise of the machines. 
Sounds like something from a Terminator film. Construction Robotics has developed a robot called SAM, short for semi-automated mason, which can lay 3,000 bricks a day. That's significantly more than most builders who can lay an average of 500 bricks a day. And this is set to turn the construction industry on its head. The devices have already started replacing bricklayers on a handful of sites in America, Asia, Germany, and the UAE. And Construction Robotics are open to introduce the robots into Great Britain within the next two years. And with further innovations and advances in site plant being made, this now provides us unprecedented opportunities. The downside is it's replacing traditional skills which can only impact on the skill shortages affecting our global industry. And it's suggested by 2050, many brick workers will be out of work. <coughs> Watch this space, this is happening. Adrian X is a robot that can lay a thousand bricks an hour from a stationary position and build a house in just two days. Rather than using the traditional method of cement to hold bricks together, Adrian X uses a special construction glue as an adhesive. And it's capable of working with bricks of almost any size and can cut, grind and mill each brick to fit. The robot is mounted on the back of a truck enabling it to simply tra be transported to construction sites. It has a 92 foot boom that is attached to the main unit and it uses its hand or claw to pick up the clay bricks following instruction for 3D CAD software and a laser guided system. This is also happening. Exco Skeletons, founded in 2005 and based in California. Exco Bionics has worked on Exco Skeletons for military and health applications, but has since developed further powered suits to aid in the physical therapy for people who have suffered strokes or been involved in serious accidents. And over 4,000 people have used the suit as part of their rehabilitation process in learning to walk again. Its latest creation will enhance rather than replace human capabilities, and Exco skeleton suits are now being aimed at the construction and industrial sectors. The lightweight suit does not have a conventional power source, but instead utilizes counterweights and a sprung arm. The physical arm is called a zero-G, and the zero-G arm takes a tool weight, enabling workers to operate heavy tools without exerting themselves, and other tools can then be used in conjunction with the suit including large grinders, sanders and polishers, rigid rivet busters and rotary hammers. Again, this is on its way. The Dagri Smart Helmet, which is intended to increase productivity, efficiency and safety. The helmet contains a sophisticated sensing technology and an array of cameras that together capture 360 degree views. A computing program within the camera called IntelliTrack captures processes and displays information about the user's surroundings. The smart helmet knows how, to, how you move through a space and it can map the environment and start to create a 3D reconstruction of a facility. These helmets are already in use on a number of sites globally and both virtual and augmented reality are operational within its use. But at a cost of £17,000 each, they're clearly not for throwing around in your boot bag. <laughs> so... Technology. Technology in the construction industry of the seen it is advancing at a rapid rate. The introduction of building information modeling and the digital collaboration process that goes with it is revolutionizing the construction industry. And off-site modular techniques are promoted as an enabler with construction then able to learn the production line lessons from the manufacturing areas. <coughs> Many people are predicting worker-free building sites by 2050 where we once saw hard arts and high-vis jackets, there could be robotic bulldozers coordinated by drones <coughs> circulating overhead, with 3D printers churning out new design at a pace beyond that of human skill. However, there remain real challenges to make today's fictions tomorrow's reality. But what about the introduction of artificial intelligence? More than three quarters of the built environment professionals believe that artificial intelligence will have a positive impact on the infrastructure sector, but most believe that it will never fully take up human interaction. And let's not forget the words of Albert Einstein from the earlier slide. Many people think that artificial intelligence could pose a threat to jobs in the sector, but with a large number believing that artificial intelligence will lead to new skills, improved quality, improved quality standards, improved awareness, and numerous professional opportunities. The Innovation 2050 publication 
quotes that artificial intelligence is an integral part of our lives and it's now only right that it should be considered to help better our quality standards and boost productivity and generally improve how we manage our infrastructure. It opens a door to new ways of working with the potential to improve performance and efficiency. Much has been made of the skills gap we face, but the benefits of arti artificial intelligence may go some way towards mitigating the problem. By combining the use of artificial intelligence alongside continued efforts to recruit and to train the next generation of architects and engineers, we can future-proof our workforce, the health of the industry, and the wider economy. Our industry and much of society is only beginning to realize the transformative power of artificial intelligence. And now is the time to assess and analyze how we can best take advantage of it, identifying both the challenges and opportunities and how built environment professionals and technology sector should work together to build the necessary leadership. So this is the big discussion. How artificial intelligence can improve quality, awareness, and productivity. What do you think? Is this a building control surveyor? Is it a clerk of works? Is it a sewage CDM, health and safety advisor? What do you think? What are your views? The case for machines in the workplace has been proven again and again. And in many cases, robotic robots can increase efficiency and quality whilst reducing errors and waste. According to Forbes, by 2035, AI, AI technologies have the potential to increase productivity by 40% and economic growth by 1.7% across 16 industries, including construction. And as well as improved efficiencies, it can also mean advances in health and safety as robots and technology can be used to assess sites and complete jobs that many are too dangerous for humans. Recently, construction giant Bell for Beatty published its report Innovation 2050, it's out there now for you to download. A digital future for the infrastructure industry. They believe that by 2050, construction sites will be human free and the only interaction will be through robotics. According to the report, the role of humans will predominantly be to oversee projects remotely, assessing 3D and 4D visuals and data from the on-site machines and ensuring the building is proceeding to specification. And very few people will access the site itself, but those who do will robotically enhance, will wear robotically enhanced exoskeletons, which will control the machinery and other robots on site. Oh. So is that a site of the future? Everything I've just discussed through this presentation, modular construction, robotics, the Dagri Smart Helmets, BIM 360. That's all included within that site. Minimum personnel. What's your views? That's what they're predicting. And is this where we are? Is this what we're now entering? Are we ready? Are we now entering the fourth industrial revolution? Many in industry believe we are. We live and work in an ever more globalized marketplace in which initiative, innovation, and continuous improvement and essential to our prosperity. And the future of any construction project requires the commitment and encouragement of many participants in our industry, which assists in shaping industry policy and global compliance. But despite the benefits these technologies may bring, it's important to remember that technology does not sit in isolation. It's part of a larger academic domain, which is forward thinking and which embraces industry trends while harmonizing and improving quality standards and professional initiatives. The global challenge and the extent of the problems facing all professionals in the construction sector is to maintain and provide inspiration to innovation and continued creativity. And it's important that today's professionals and those of the future take the opportunity to engage with others and to collaborate and, and, and educate with others on the best way to move forward. We've come a long way, but the journey ahead is much longer. Industry movement is now happening, and this presentation has simply been a highlight of the digital technology which is reshaping our future and at considerable pace. So I hope you enjoyed, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.